Church, if you all are happy to be in the Lord's house today, would y'all make a joyful noise? Man, if you guys will, please do me a huge favor. Stand up, find somebody that you do not know, and make it your mission to get to know their first name. We are a cross aisle church, so don't be afraid to move around a little bit. Say hey, shake a hand, give a hug, wave from a distance, whatever you want to do. And if you're joining us from online, we want to say thank you for watching. No matter where you're from, please type in your name, type where you're watching from, and let people know how you're doing and why you're watching us today. You are valued here this morning. Man. Crossing Church, happy Easter. How you guys doing today? Yeah? You guys doing good? If you would, do me a favor. Turn to somebody next to you and say, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Woo! Now turn to your other person that was your second choice and say, I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> you know, there is such a joy and wonder as as a pastor coming into the Easter season. There's all this excitement and all this, this tension because you want to make sure that you do the best job you can celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And more than his birth and more than his life, the thing that gives us hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lot of times we focus on the cross, and that was important because he went there for our sins, for our iniquities, for the things that we did before us and during us and after us for the generations that have been, are right now, and ever will be, that is who Jesus Christ died on the cross for. But if that's where the story ended, there'd still be mourning in the streets. There would be no joy in the morning because the joy in the morning comes not from a brutal execution. It comes not from the crucifixion and the death of our Jesus and our Lord and our Savior. It comes from the resurrection and the fact that the tomb is still empty. God is still alive and he is seated on the throne in heaven waiting for us to get here and he will come back again for his people. Amen? Whew. Of all the sermons preached, the best ones come not from big cathedrals. They don't come from ornate temples or behind beautiful dioceses. They don't come from the greatest mines in the world. They don't come from the highest mountaintops. They stem from one singular place, an empty grave, a grave that was filled for three days and by the power of God is still empty this morning. And without that hope, Without that life, all the songs we sing, all the things that we do, all the ties that we give, all the, the days that we, that we look into God's face and we say, thank you for saving us without that empty grave, all of that is for naught. And today, we get a wonderful opportunity to look into exactly how that happened. And we're going to do our best this morning to look at this from a slightly different perspective. We're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ not as a historical event, not as something that happened to a different group of people in a different time, a little bit over 2,000 years ago, but we want to do our best to take a ground level look, a look as the people who were there, what this meant to them, and then ultimately what this also means to us today. You see, when I look at Jesus Christ as a historical figure, it removes some of his personhood from that. It removes some of the closeness of that relationship that we have from him. When it's just something that archaeologists study and historians debate and atheists and Christians argue over, then it doesn't make it my God. It makes it something to be looked at in a textbook. But before we look at that, we have to ask ourselves a very important question. Does the empty tomb matter? Does it really matter? 
Does it really matter that when the disciples went looking for him that he was not there? Does it really matter that when the Romans went looking for his body that they couldn't find it? Because if he was there, then this death would have everlasting effects because every Christian prayer would be invalidated. Only a fool would pray to a dead man. Every Christian funeral is a fraud, and all the the joy and the hope that we preach at these funerals for people who have passed away, sons and daughters and parents and grandparents, all that would be for naught because when we say there will be a great reunion and a great resurrection, if his resurrection didn't take place, how in the world can mine? You see, it comes down to this. If God couldn't save himself, how could I think he can save me? And that is why the empty tomb matters. The apostle Paul makes this argument on our behalf in a different way. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And what he means by that, when we are in our sins, we are separated from God. We cannot have salvation when our sins are separating us from the perfection and the divine glory of our Savior. And if that didn't happen, then we are still lost and there is no hope. Which is why it makes me so happy today to tell you that the evidence that the tomb of Jesus is empty is overwhelming. And we could go into it for a long time and there have been whole college classes and seminaries and debates dedicated to this subject. But we'll just cover a few briefly right here. Virtually every scholar that has examined the evidence has said that Jesus died on the cross. Like he was, he was really dead. He was deader than a doorknob. He was deader than a doornail. I don't, I don't even know where that saying came from, right? But he was really dead. There's not a single historical record that we can find of somebody surviving the crucifixion. Not only that, but there are multiple eyewitness accounts and texts that are written over nine, both in Scripture and outside of Scripture, where people say that A, the tomb was empty, and B, that they met the risen Lord and Savior. That's a lot of historical evidence for something that happened 2,000 plus years ago. And C, even the greatest opponents of his resurrection still couldn't produce his body. The most powerful empire in the world at that time with all its resources and all its manpower and all its money and all its sophistry couldn't find the body. You see, Jesus didn't reside in a dead tomb any more than God resides in dead temples today. He is risen. So let's take a look at how this unfolded. If you guys will join me in Luke chapter 24, verse 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick up this story. Jesus has already died. He went to the cross. He was tried. He was crucified. He was beaten. He was battered. He died. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And now it's time for these people to go and tend to him. And it says this, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, if you will, join me for just a moment and let's adjust our perspective. For just a minute, imagine that this isn't something that happened to somebody else. Imagine that you're not 2,000 plus years removed from this event. Imagine that this wasn't just some historical figure who was killed, but this was your friend. This was your brother. This was your son who was sent to the cross. And on that morning when you wake up, it's time to go take care of the body. But you feel just a little bit numb. 
because there's a hole in your chest where a, a friendship, a mentorship, a relationship used to be. And for these last couple years, you've been on this ride of a journey with him through various ways, and you've seen the miracles he's done. You've witnessed him heal the massive. You've seen the lame walk and the blind see and the lepers be healed. You've looked at this, and you thought in varying degrees that maybe, just maybe, this was the Son of God. This was the Messiah that was talked about in the Old Testament that was prophesied to save our people and you started to have a little hope. You thought, man, maybe this is it. Like, this is the guy all my ancestors were talking about. And you got a little excited, and you had a little pep in your step, and you had a little smile on your face, and you had a whole bunch of things going right in your life, and everything that went wrong, you were with the Son of God. He fixed it. You have a hurt ankle, you're like, well, Jesus, look, like right there, you made the blame, lame walk, like my ankle is just twisted. Like, you, you help a brother out, like things happened on this trip, and you had hopes for it, and you had dreams for it, and he was going to restore the world, and now he's dead. And he's not just dead, but he's really dead. He was killed in a way that was brutal. He was tried for sins that he did not commit. And this morning, when you wake up, you don't feel the loss of some ancient person. Feel the loss right here. And your eyes are still a little red with tears. Your face is still a little puffy. And your mind is still in shock. Because everything you knew has been flipped upside on its head. And instead of getting ready to go celebrate one of the biggest festivals and feasts in this entire culture with your favorite person in the whole world, with your son, with your mentor, with your friend, you're getting ready to go prepare his body because he is dead. And along with it went your hope. I think every one of us in here in different ways can identify a little bit with this. If we scrape up against old wounds because each and every one of us in here have lost loved ones. Some of us has lost parents, grandparents, friends. Some of us have lost children. We feel like we're walking around every day with a limb missing. We've been betrayed, we've been lied to, we've been handed over to our adversaries, and we've seen ones we loved treated that way. And in a way, just a little bit, we can empathize from a ground level, face to face, with the people, both Marys, with Joanna, with all the other people that aren't named going to this tomb. Because at some point, we've all done something just a little similar. And now all of a sudden, it's not somebody else's loss, it's mine. Now all of a sudden, it's not somebody else's shame, it's mine. Now all of a sudden, it's not somebody else who lied or betrayed him, it's not somebody else who abandoned him at the foot of the cross, it's not somebody else who denied him, but it's me. Because we made it real. And what this does is it makes it that Jesus isn't just a savior, but he's my savior. It makes it so that Jesus didn't just die for the world, but he died for me. He didn't just forgive sins, but he forgave my sins, my iniquities. My shame is no more because this was my God. In the end, we have to ask ourselves this. Do we really understand what it meant for Jesus to go to the cross? And if we do, 
Are we living like it in our daily walk? Or are we just pretending? In Luke 24, verses 2 through 5, it says this, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, I love what this says here. It says they bowed down in fear. In some of the other uh, gospels, what it says is the angels told them, don't be afraid. That's like telling somebody looking at a car tow truck running down the road at them like, hey, don't move, stay there. Like, it's kind of silly when you think about it, like, bam, there's, there's like Jesus spoke with angels and like heavenly things. And you're like, what's going on? And they're like, hey, don't be afraid, bro. And you're like, are you nuts? Like, I came for a dead man and now I got people that look like lightning. And they say to them, I know who you're looking for. I know what you're here for. Look at this in verse five. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, the angels said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Sometimes we need lightning to strike in our midst before we get it. Sometimes we're walking along and there's signs flashing and there's people waving and there's people like, TJ, look over here. And we're just looking around and we need somebody with a baseball bat to smack us upside the head before we get the idea that we need to pay attention to something. Because, and this struck me hard this week, these folks had been with Jesus for years. For years, they watched the miracles. They saw him feed the 5,000. I wish I could feed the 5,000. You know how much sushi would be here every Sunday? (laughs) Amen, hallelujah, praise Jesus. We'd have ramen for days. Like, it would be great. He fed the 5,000. The lame leaped and the blind saw. Like, this, all this stuff happened. He turned water into wine. Like, no wonder why everybody liked Jesus. He was a great guy. Like, he saw all of this stuff. They saw him flip the Pharisees on their head and whip the people in the temple, saying, you turned my father's house into a den of thieves. They were there. They experienced it. And when he died, they still went to the grave. Just a couple days earlier, Jesus had told them, and it's recorded in the Gospels, the Son of Man is going to go away for a time. But don't worry, I go to my Father's house to prepare a room for you. But they didn't see it then. They needed their lightning moment. They needed the ability for somebody to smack them upside the head and say, look here, son. I want you to see something, and this will change your life. I wonder how many of us have been coming to church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, listening to sermon after sermon, praying prayer after prayer, and going to Easter after Easter, And yet we still, come Monday, find ourselves in a grave, surrounded by dead people, doing dead things with no hope. Because it's one thing to talk about Jesus. It's one thing to sing about Jesus. It's another thing to to clap hands with Kate and with Penny when they're rocking it and with the wonderful singers here. It's one thing to see the greeters that you like and, you know, all the lovely people that are here and to have your kids run into the room. But it's another thing entirely to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because what he does is he calls you out of that tomb. He said, where you're looking for me, you can't find me. Look what they said in 24, 6 of Luke. He is not here. He has risen. We can live because he is alive. We are free because he paid the price. The chains of sin and shame are broken because Jesus rose from the grave. And right now, here today, on this Easter, he is standing at the entrance to your tomb saying, come out. 
Don't stay there because you do not belong. When you are in Jesus Christ, you have been called from the grave as ones who will never die because we are new creations, new creatures made in his image, forgiven by his blood, brought by his righteousness and grace so that we can have everlasting life with him. And so the real question of today is this. What about your grave? We've talked a lot about Jesus' tomb. But is your tomb empty? Have you accepted the salvation of Jesus Christ? Have you been bought by his blood? Because if not, man, we would love nothing more than to do that with you today. And guys, this is so big, this is so important. Our mission as a church is to see all people cross over from death to life in Jesus Christ. That doesn't matter whether you're black or you're white, doesn't matter whether you're American or you're some other ethnicity, it doesn't matter whether you're from a different country, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much hair you have or how good you can sing or how, how weird looking you are or how eloquent you talk or how educated you are. All people, and they're weird people. Have y'all looked at yourselves lately? God don't make mistakes, but sometimes he came close. (laughs) I can say that because y'all look at me every Sunday like, this dude's weird. Y'all right. And every week, I talk with people who are burdened by their past. Who are shamed by things that they've either done in their lives or how they reacted to things done to them in their lives. And every week seems like it gets just a little bit heavier. It's a little bit deeper. There's more things for us to carry. There's more shame to go around. Everybody wants to talk about what we should feel and what we should say and how we should be and what's right and wrong, and we don't know. Have y'all looked outside? The world's on fire. We could roast marshmallows, right? Like every single piece of it, it is, you're like, holy cow, like I'm getting a tan just from watching. But what are we going to do about it? Is your tomb empty? Mm. And are we living like it? Or are we still surrounding ourselves with dead things? You know, a story that gets me every time in Scripture is Lazarus. And uh, we're going to go over it real fast as we get ready to close. Lazarus was Mary and Martha's brother. And this guy got sick. They had a great relationship with Jesus Christ. And they were very, very good friends as the band gets ready to come back and play. And Lazarus was getting ready to die. And so Mary and Martha send off for Jesus. They know he's in a town about four to six hours away. Like he's not far And so they send off saying, hey, Jesus, look, like something's happening to Lazarus. The man you love like a brother is getting ready to die. Can you do us a favor? Because they'd seen this before, right? This is nothing new to them. They'd been in the presence of Jesus when he had worked miracles. Can you do us a favor? If you save the people you don't even know, surely you're going to save someone you love like a brother. Come on over. Let's get some laying on of hands. Let's do a Benny Hen thing. Like, be healed. I don't know what they were thinking, but hey, Jesus, come on over. And what Jesus does is he gets word. Y'all never seen Benny Hen, right? Yeah, have y'all seen Benny Hen? Have y'all seen like the Sith lightning one with him? Go look it up on YouTube. It's amazing. Y'all laugh more tomorrow, okay? And Jesus gets word and stays right where he's at. And Lazarus dies. And he's put in a tomb. And Jesus gets there four 
days later. Now, there's a lot of reasons why most people think he got there four days later because it was thought at the temples of Athena that you could be raised from the dead up to three days later, right? And so a lot of people think that Jesus waited that extra day just to show that the act he was about to perform was beyond any other god or deity that these people worshipped. And when he comes to the gate, Mary and Martha get word, and, and Mary is like, uh-uh, I ain't going to see Jesus. I used to like that guy, but I ain't so sure about him now. But Martha, she has a bone to pick. She, she's going to give Jesus a piece of her mind. How many of you guys have ever been a little mad at God? Amen. I saw like three honest people and a whole bunch of liars. I pray for y'all later. Guess what? God is a big boy. He can take it. God can take your anger because he took Martha's. And Martha gets out there to the gate and Jesus is walking up and look what she says in verse 20 of John 11. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, Lord... In that day and age, what this word means is she was saying, I pledge my allegiance to you. You are my owner. You are the God that I follow. You are the master that I give servitude to. Lord, to them, was a standing that they placed themselves under. This was a big deal. She says, hey, Jesus, respectfully, you a jerk. I don't like you very much. Now, if you'd have been here, my brother, he wouldn't have died. How much faith and anger is contained in one sentence? Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. That's not her saying she has faith. That's her saying you could have done something about this. And I acknowledge that, but man, I don't like it right now. Because I wanted you to fix something. How many of you guys ever heard a sermon where they talk about how God is always on time? Ha! Jesus shows up in your darkest hour. It's always great. It's always blessing. It's always wonderful. It's always beautiful. Ask Lazarus if God was on time. This dude sitting up at the pearly gates, lounging on a recliner with a mimosa in one hand and a cigar in another, looking at the beach. Don't knock it till you try it, right? And and then like a little angel walks up and coughs. He's like, "Uh -uh, Mr. Lazarus. He's like, yeah, like what's up? He's like, "Uh, we don't normally do this, but they calling you back. Like he wasn't on time. His bro was late. Ask Mary and Martha if God was on time. Ask James if God was on time. Ask the apostles, almost all of which were killed in horrible ways, proclaiming and defending the faith of Jesus Christ, if if God was on time. Ask Joseph in the Old Testament, sold into slavery, with his reputation ruined even though he didn't do anything, if God was on time. See, God is not constrained by our time and our wishes, but he shows up on God's time. But man, when he does bust in those doors, crazy things are about to happen. And Jesus looks to to Martha and he says, he will rise again. And Martha's like, I know, I know on the last day he will rise again, Jesus. And this is written in a tone in the original language that was very sassy. Y'all ever heard that tone? All the husbands say no. Nope. It's very sassy. She says, I know he'll rise on that last day. But Jesus said to her in 11, 25 through 26, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha rather begrudgingly says, yes, I do, but man, I love you. I don't like you right now. And Jesus walks up to the tomb and he has them roll the stone away and he prays to God and then he calls out, Lazarus, come out of your tomb. And I love, I love the King James Version. Now it says, it says, he stinketh. He been in the desert 
in a tomb for four days. Sometimes when people are reborn, they have a little bit of gunk on them. Got to give them a little bit of time before their life gets right. And Lazarus walks out of his tomb. Right here today, Jesus is standing outside of your grave saying, come out. Stand up and walk. Because the place you're living in right now, that's not the place that you're meant to be. See, a lot of us, even though it's Sunday morning, we're still living on Friday. And S.M. Lockridge had a, a very famous sermon and perhaps one of the best quotes that I've ever heard about this from back in the 70s and the 80s. And it, it goes like this. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's is sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying, but they don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying, Peter is denying, but they don't know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday, the Romans, they beat my Jesus. They rove him in scars and they crowned him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling. His spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning and people are sinning and evil is grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers, they nailed my Savior's hand to the cross. And they nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up in between two criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday is coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king and the Pharisees are celebrating. Their scheming has been achieved, but they don't know. It's only Friday and Sunday is coming. It's Friday and he is hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his followers, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, man, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, and the earth trembles, the skies grow dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope has lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan, he's just a laughing, because it's Friday. It's Friday, Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It's only Friday, you see, because Sunday's coming. And for many of us right now, we are living in Friday, but I've got a message of hope for you guys today because today is Sunday. Jesus is no longer in his tomb. He's no longer dead. He's no longer crucified on that tree. He has rose and he has ascended and he did it for you and me. It was Friday, but now it's Sunday. And if we can't get excited about that and if we can't praise him about that, then we have lost our minds because God said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And that is exactly what he did because it's not Friday, it's Sunday. And Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, hid in Egypt, raised in Nazareth, baptized in the Jordan, healing along the roads, making water into wine, flipping tables in the temples, feeding the 5,000. Jesus Christ, that is my king. Jesus Christ, the man who tackled tough issues and who said, I will sit with sinners and I will dine with the undinable and I will love 
the unlovable and I will forgive the unforgivable, Jesus Christ. That is my king and he didn't die a little bit. No, he died so much that the skies darkened, that the earth trembled, that the veil was torn in two and that the grave split open. That is my king, but he didn't stay that way because it's Sunday. God rose from the dead. He proclaimed victory over all the world. And then he looked at you and he looked at me and said, come join me. Because this salvation that I have is for everybody. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing our last song. And man, we're going to praise a king who turns craves into gardens, who, who turns bones into armies, who turns sin and shame into his glory and fame. And we're going to get to do something pretty cool. As you walked in here today, you probably saw the, the decorations in the back that look like a tomb. And after we're done singing that song, there. They're gonna play a little bit and sing graves in the gardens and we get to walk out through our tomb and I want this to signify for you a decision that you have. And I can't make it for you, your friend can't make it for you, your spouse can't make it for you, but only you can. And the decision is this. Come tomorrow morning, is your grave gonna be full or is it going to be empty? Are you going to live in Friday? Or are you going to rise with Sunday? And on the outside of that door, you're going to see a little flower. And I'd love to say that I performed a miracle and it'll never die, but it's really just made of rubber. And on that, there's, there's a verse and an explanation of what we want you to do with the flower, but we, we ask that you take one per family and then you put that flower someplace with that verse someplace that you and your family are gonna see it every single day and use that as a reminder when you're going through the valleys of life, when you're soaring through the, the clouds or, or when you're falling to the ground, whatever place of life you're in, to recognize that no matter what grave you're in right now, God can turn it into a garden. You just have to give it over to him. And after that song, if you'd like to know more about this Jesus that we, we sing about and we talk about, and maybe you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to be out in the lobby in the connect room. And I would love nothing more than to talk about your salvation this morning with you. So if you will, please stand and sing our last song and then we'll be dismissed to walk out and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ.